All right. Well, welcome to the Connecticut Historical Society Lunch and Learn, Punch and Judy, Tradition, Popular Culture, and Puppetry. Our presenter today, Dr. Jungmin Song, is an assistant professor in residence at the Department of Dramatic Arts and a research associate at the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry at the University of Connecticut. And she has curated the exhibition excuse me, exhibitions Shakespeare and Puppetry in 2010 and Puppetry's Racial Reckoning in 2021, in the, both at the Ballard. Korean-born Dr. Sung lived, studied, and worked in London, England for nearly 20 years before she started working at UConn in 2019. So thank you so much, Min, for joining us today, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I will start sharing my screen first. Yeah. Um, make it a slideshow. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining uh, joining me, me for this talk. Um, Today I'm going to talk about like British puppet tradition called Punch and Judy. I don't know how much how many of you actually have seen Punch and Judy show, but um, hopefully this uh, this uh, kind of presentation is a kind of good way into. It. Yeah, everybody can hear me. Yes, fine. Yes, good. Uh, <laughs> Good. Uh, it's introduction. Good introduction, and also I I'd like to uh introduction to this beautiful trad beautiful tradition, and then um that is also regarded as uh, uh one of the English icons and loved by public in 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 Britain, and then so I want to talk also. I I also want to talk about the controversies around uh, this uh this puppet shows that about around its violence and the racism that kind of weaved into the stories. Um, I'm so also I I do like to hi uh, I do like to talk a little bit about where I stand also. And so I'm originally from South Korea and then. Um, probably started to see um, Punch and Judy show around 10 years ago. And then, uh, and like, like many parts of Asia, like traditions were after going through colonial era that traditions were kind of destroyed and cleaned up uh, in many ways under the name of revolutions and modernization. At the same time, this is the, a lot of this tradition, um, like performing arts and then like everyday customs, also like or people kind of present it as something eternal and untouchable, and then like some whole something holy. So to me, that around that Punch and Judy controversy that it's been on around and for a long time. And even there are some people saying that we need to get rid of Punch and Judy is too violent. To me that the fact that actually the controversy itself is uh, kind of telling, what the controversy telling me was that actually it kind of testify it is its liveness, how lively it is. It is actually living tradition that otherwise people won't say that you can let's get rid of it because it just testified it's there. So that's to um, that's that lifeness of the Punch and Judy. That's what I want to talk about today. Um, so before I start, I'd like to there's a con content warning here because there is some there will be this in presentation includes images and descriptions of violence and racism. Uh, that may affect some audience here. So I'd like you to, to be aware of this before I want to start, I, I start the presentation. And so, as I said, like I, by no means I'm not an expert in Punch and Judy. Uh, there are kind of two exhibitions. One is at the Ballard Museum or Institute and Museum of Puppetry, they're where I work and I curate. Uh, and then the, the, there's a, also there was another exhibition that in Connecticut history 
Hercog Society, who's actually hosting the talk today. There is like one exhibition each that kind of have uh, two exhibitions had something in common that was Punch and Judy. That's why I'm kind of start doing, uh, I'm, I'm invited to do this talk um, today. Um, oh, this, uh, yes. So this is the exhibition I created in, in, at the Ballard, Ballard Museum in store in University of Connecticut uh, last year. It was a puppetry's racial reckoning. Um, so this exhibition was about uh, images of minorities. We mainly the puppets uh, of, of uh, images of rep uh, representation of re representations of minorities uh, in America, and then uh, the foreign words were how that were those represented in American puppetry. Those were the main uh, features of that exhibition. And then those, those images also have a, have a strong presence of Orientalism and then uh, racism in it. Um, the exhibition was composed of three, um, uh, three sections. One was, uh, uh, the first one was Spectacle of the Orient. Um, the first is the, the spectacle of the Orient section uh, featured the um, puppetry that has a strong element of, of Orientalism. So it has uh, puppets by Tony Sarg, uh, who, was known, who is known as father of American, uh, father of American modern puppetry. And then Frank Ballard. So Ballard is uh, the, where our name, our institution's name come from, uh, who did uh, many operas. Um, and then one of them were Mikado, that is Orientalist opera um, composed by, uh, created by Gilbert and Sullivan. And then he, in creating puppets, making this opera uh, puppet performance, he used a lot of racist um, imagery circulating during 1960s and 70s in, in, in the making of his puppets. And also, Seas for Cookie, Sketch for Sesame Street. Uh, it's a, it's a, like parody of uh, opera Aida that has the uh, Oriental, it's the Orientalist opera that is, uh, is portraying the fantasy of Egypt. Um, so all these things were um, not, this exhibition was not planned and created, not, not just not to kind of blame these artists. They were, they were by no means, they were still loved by all of us and respected as one of the important, uh, like most important pe people in the puppetry world. While it was, well, what I intend to do was to, and talking about how racism and orientalism looking up look look like and then like how then that how we how we can understand racism in in current society that's uh, that's uh, the that's the kind of a the objectives of that the exhibition um and then puppets were presented as lenses for the racism and the second section was uh, uh, was minstrel, minstrelsy and then its legacy. Um, there was um, so I mean I mean probably many of you already know that minstrel blackface minstrel performance was um was like mostly white people wearing black makeup and then caricature performing caricatured African Americans. Um, and then it was emerged in 19, early 19th century and then pretty much dominated American puppet, uh, not puppet, American popular culture all throughout the 19th century until it kind of slowly died out at the turn of the centuries. Um, it, it has a huge impact. I mean, in, it is reported as there was nothing but uh, minstrel in the US performance art, uh, performing a scene uh, live entertainment at that time. Um, it, it has a lasting impact 
uh, until after it dies out. And then like even now that where everyone says, no, you cannot show that images of menstrual, but it still live with us. And then it also not just to not just in the US, it also had a global impact. Um, its popularity had a global impact and then it, it influenced the other popular culture uh, all around the world. So what we had uh, in the exhibition was um, jig dolls. It was uh, like small puppets that was mostly performed on street that is, it, we don't have the platform. It kind of, um, it, it has like, a, it has, a, it performs in vibrating perform, uh, platform. It has illusory limbs. If we, if, as the platform vibrates, it starts, up, starts to jig. Um, and then the other one, is a ventriloquist dummy uh, whose name was Sambo. From no one of the uh, racist trope uh, derived from minstrelsy. Um, next, and then we had uh, groups of Punch and Judy figures. So Punch and Judy, uh, Punch is the puppet you see with the kind of long, uh, tall hat, and then his wife Judy next to him. And then um, it also uh, had the menstrual figures that's in the, uh, the, the middle in the first row. It's not just the punch and uh, uh, black figures, black face figures, they punch and Judy include. Punch and Judy also include other minorities is uh, we see that like maybe nowadays people will see as all white, but at the time Irish and Scottish or the all Italians or Germans, they all regarded different people. So I have a Scottish and then also the other character like featured in uh, uh, in Punch and Judy. Most of the Punch and Judy show is a devil. So so this was a uh, this was a figure we recently um, got uh, uh, acquired uh, our museum acquired like last a uh, couple of years ago from uh, Glenn Paulson uh, collector Glenn Paulson. So Fred Nealon, who owned the puppet and then performed with this puppet, were a uh, magician. Um, like a lot of Punch and Judy performers in the US were magicians who picked up Punch and Judy later as a kind of side act. So Fred Nealon was one of them. Um, and then so as um, so as Albert Walker, who who's uh, the exhibition uh, was uh, the exhibition of his uh, uh, contents of his trunk was uh, uh, was uh, at the Connecticut Historical Society uh, last year, uh, like uh, closed this year. So Albert Walker uh, was a farmer. I mean, if you haven't seen this exhibition, I give you some short introduction. He's a farmer, factory worker, worker. And then also at the same time, he was amateur magician and then, and then Punch and Judy man. Um, so I think the, the exhibition kind of put to what I read, I don't know if we have a curator of the exhibition in the, in the audience. What I read from the exhibition was um, there were a lot of emphasis on him being ordinary man. Um, he's, uh, he was not a famous guy. He was an ordinary guy. But what takes him apart from other people was he kept, uh, he kept his, uh, he documented his life in his diary. So you see in the, on the wall, you can see, that all the, 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 the diaries he, he left there. And then he also left his trunk full of um, objects that he used for his magic shows. And then that also, and, and then, um, and Punch and Judy puppets. And then they had, were looked after by his descendants and they donated. Um, no, I think. I don't think we still got social society to actually bought this, right? Um, and then, so, so 
so one of them, one of the the objects that were in his trunk was his the the bronze size for his show. Uh, there was, I think it was on the wall of the exhibition. It's printed out and then uh, on and then was exhibited on the wall when, when it was on the Connecticut Historical Society. And then program, this program, I, you cannot read, so I, I rewrote it on the, this PowerPoint that the scene describing the skill by which Abdallah or Moorish juggler obtained his freedom and the hands of Ferdinand at the, at the, at the hands of Ferdinand Castile in 1830. And then, and then he, oh, I think I made some mistake on that, on that writing. And then it's also Wizard Victoria of Moorish Games and then Prince Aladdin's Glass and then also Astonishing Feet of the Hindustan Rings. I mean, this is, this guy, like this ordinary man who were probably in work mostly in rural Connecticut, that he, you can read uh, this uh, word of Orientalism in his, uh, in his uh, advertisement of, of his uh, magic show. Then also the trunk uh, included uh, the Punch and Judy puppets he used for his show. And then that include a uh, black puppet um, uh, represent um, African American uh, representation of minstrel uh, characters. Um, also, the exhibition also put uh, put uh, also the 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 curatorship of the exhibition also gave that background of all this being has has the background of orientalism and racism in it um so this is uh, kind of like where this is a kind of the route that where i come from and then the host of this talk want to kind of investigate together perhaps this uh, through this talk yes so I'd like to now go into how I uh, experienced uh, Punch and Judy in, um, oh, sorry, I'm trying to, oh, sorry, I can't do it. <laughs> so this was, it's, um, uh, uh, so my first encounter of, with the Punch and Judy was Mayfair. It was not, it was probably, was uh, probably around the year after I arrived in England. So I arrived in England around 2001. And then I think I saw, I went to the Mayfair uh, in 2002 for the first time. Then it, it's held in Covent Garden in central London. I don't know if you've been to, if you've been to London or like um, no London, that Covent Garden is uh, in the center of the London. It's probably, Nowadays, mostly uh, filled with the tourists, where the Royal Opera House is in, and then where used to be, uh, where it's featured in like My Fair Lady, where it used to be like a, a, a flower market in My Fair Lady was, but now it's uh, with the restaurants and very well gentrified. But it has uh, that feeling of all the old, uh, old center of performing arts. Uh, in a way that a lot of theaters around there. Um, so, so Mayfair works. I mean, I was, I was, I was, I did, I went there without knowing where I was. I think somebody asked me out, somebody, something like that. So I was there. And then, uh, so how the day goes is they start with people bring this punch puppets, and then they all go around the, the central London street. And then um, doing a procession, big procession with the brass band. And then at around the noon, they all, they arrive at the church, the St. Paul's church. And then there's a special service at the church with the punch, people with the punch puppet going on the pulpit. And then, and then after the church service, at the garden, also in the garden of the church, like punch punch booths were set all around. Like there are a couple of the, like two, I don't know, like 
20, 30 booths on like set around the edge of the of the garden, like along with like tombstones and stuff. And then there's a show begin. And then the show starts like um it's like continuation of punch shows, like each last like 10, 15 minutes, and then one finish and the next booth start, and then it lasts the whole afternoon of punch and judy show. So the people who come and see the show just to watch punch shows, this performance, like they as much as many as they want. Like this, are we when when we go there, we saw like six, seven shows, but all similar have a similar story, but depend depending on who performs it, it's also wildly different. Um it's, it's that is a Mayfair. So when I was there in 2002, like it was uh, just a year after I arrived in England, and then it was, uh, I wasn't, it was kind of difficult, it's kind of too much to take in, in a way that like, oh, to me that still, to me that English tradition was represented by like perhaps like royal family and then afternoon tea and then like tea dance, so that kind of like, Gentile England, that's what I had, but this was pretty wild. And then like a oh, oh, bad language <laughs> and then lots of slapsticks. And we will we'll get into talk about slapstick later, but this this is, um, this is slap the, I, I mean, I grew up in Korea. We had American cartoons watching Tom and Jerry's and then it was already, like to, to all throughout 1990s, we had uh, Home Alone like aired every Christmas, every winter. But maybe I, I never liked the slapstick. And then I kind of it was difficult to laugh. Slapstick before, but still, Punch and Judy slapstick didn't quite well come across to me as it kind of didn't kind of crack me to laugh at all. And then like all this uh, then buzz and like extreme liveness was kind of, I wasn't quite sure how to digest it in a way. Um, so yeah, that's who I was. And then after 10 years, around 10 years after, I, I got to kind of, I start dating with one of the Punch and Judy enthusiasts. And then now I married him, but also, uh, and then he brought me back to Punch and Judy circle uh, in around 2012. So, and then since then, I kind of got really more kind of think more seriously about it, I think. Uh, so next. So the, uh, so the place uh, we, I, the, the place, the St. Paul's churchyard, well, is where the plaque uh, is there, uh, where the St. Paul, uh, Clock that says Punch and Judy show was first performed in England and witnessed by Samuel Pepsi, uh, Pepe's. Um, it was set in 1962. So it was the, the place where the Punch and Judy show was first spotted by Samuel Pepsi. And then it, it had, he has a diary entry. Like the diaries are very important. Like if you kind of make, I think writing diaries in a way you are actually making history, like Albert. And then also here is another guy, Samuel Pepe. Um, so this plaque was set in there in 1962, uh, 1962, like 300 years after that the, di the that entry was written, uh, with the um. Uh, so George Spade, who was a theater historian who did a lot of research on like the foundational research on Punch and Judy, uh, along with the, the Punch and Judy practitioners, we call Punch and Judy uh, professors, they decide, they kind of declare that entry day, uh, May 9th, 1662, as Punch's birthday. So Mayfair, the one I saw, we, I just introduced is actually a Punch's birthday party, and at the at, at his birthplace. Um, so there, where they actually created, they actually give a tradition of birthday, like a human, or anymore, like a living being, and and give them throw out its a birthday party every year. It's Mayfair. Um, 
But the interesting thing about I found it, I found it very interesting is that what Samuel Samuel Pepe saw in still like from now it was three hundred exactly three hundred and sixty years ago was very different from what we know as Punch and Judy now. Um, there was um, it was Punch and Judy was uh, originate uh, was a uh, uh, was performed by Italian puppeteer who performed the Puncinella puppets that is uh, uh, based on Commedia Art, uh, Commedia del Arte, that is Italian street performance, uh, um, like largely um, composed of uh, the characters composed like stock characters from different regions in Italy. And then they he looked like the one that you see on the left side of the screen. And then he had the uh, so punch current punch carried uh, carried over some of the characteristics like punch back and crooked nose and then puff 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 belly big belly, uh, but he was mostly black and white. And then he didn't um, have that. Um, so the, this uh, what you see is red and white stripes, and then. Like it's why the characteristics were not there, and then it was not hand puppet. What Samuel Pepe saw it was a um, was a string puppet, and then uh, the stories probably were not probably not recorded, but the it was not the story what we know as Punch and Judy story. Now, so some of the other um, things uh, carried. Over from the Commedia dell'arte tradition is a swazo. The punchy has a very squeaky voice that is uh, done by these uh, two pieces of metal. Is uh, put it in uh, the puppeteer's mouth. They kind of make your voice like kind of on the verge of annoying, but <laughs> but also at the same time very baby like. Uh, they're like you can find find the information. You can easily find that voice on on YouTube pretty easily. So it's uh, it's right on the in then it's kind of make it a little bit on incomprehensible at the same time. That is make it its voice is squeaky. This is one of the uh like the characteristics of Punch and Judy Punch Punchy voice uh in still current time. But I hear that a lot many of American Punch Judy performers don't does don't use. Swazo, but it's I think what I saw is most of the Punch and Judy preferences in England, uh, Britain, they use the Swazo. Um, and then slapstick. So slapstick is a, what we know as a slapstick comedy is actually from um, actual tool that is a performing tool, performance tool is called slapstick. So uh, it is a stick that actually so I put the left side one because it is kind of pretty, but the, you will see more clearly on the right hand side, it is Punch and Judy slapstick that is a stick that this has a one end is kind of split, is a split. So when you slap, actually what and you that the noise you actually hear is that actually that two pieces of wood, um, Slapping together. That's the and then that amplify the by amplify the noise. That's where the slapstick there is a it is a slapstick and then where the slapstick comedy the word come from. Um yes, this is no punch and judy uh performer will actually really want to slap the other puppet, you know, it's their livelihood. Is they don't want to damage the puppet. Actually, the what they want is the effect of a loud noise. And then they eventually turn into comical effect. That is uh, that is what slapstick is about. But this element is uh, currently uh, people view it kind of difficult to um, deal with. That is uh, that violence in the show. The other part of other aspect of Punch and Judy um, uh, story that current people kind of finding it very difficult to deal with is that is the domestic violence. So most of, almost all Punch and Judy show begins with the, the quarrel between Punch and his wife, Judy. So this is the illustration that accompanies the, 
very first transcription of Hanshan Judicial um, was done published in 1828. In this particular version, uh, as you, and then it's, it's uh, by and large uh, still Hanshan Judicial stories kind of performances follow this uh, kind of like a big structure of the show begins uh, that begins with it is a real story begins with uh judy bring uh their baby to punch to look after this uh, for him to look after and then he got frustrated and the baby started to cry and the punch started punch got frustrated and then Punch started to hit the baby and then throw the baby out the window. And then Judy realized, uh, Judy found out what Punch did to the baby and then bring the slapstick and then start to beat Punch. And this particular, and then Punch snapped, snatched the slapstick and then beat Judy to death. This is how the, that's the story, be, how the story begins. In this particular version, that Punch was uh, probably. He tried his best to calm down the baby, but he kind of he, he had a meltdown, and then it all the all violence starts. Um, and then, and then like, uh, and then after this is the kind of the characters appear in that particular version of Punch and Judy uh, transcription. Is that after that happens? Um, um, after that happened, Punch meets Pretty Polly. He's uh, kind of currently known as Punch's girlfriend, but in this version they just dance together. And then there are a series of other other characters appear, and then Punch actually beat them one by one. So doctor, servant, blind man, constable, officer, and Jack Cash. Jack Cash is um um is name of the uh. Not very most notorious executioner during Charles the Second time, uh, in mid seventeenth century, I think. That uh, so, so he tried to hang him, hang, hang punch, and then hang punch trick him, and then so at, at the end, hang punch actually hang Jack Cash to death. Um, so that is uh, so. That is uh, usually the storyline. And then these people come after Judy were all interchangeable. And then they you can bring the Punch and Judy professors can bring anybody they want, really. But they're kind of like important characters who typically appear, but the is very the structure itself is very, very loose. Um sorry, kind of. I was just talking a lot, and I kind of lost to where I was in my where, where I was in my note. Oh yeah, so so like looking at the, the list, like a doctor or like officers or jackets or even like Punch and Judy beat a devil. That like some people say that Punch like some say that, and then it's a kind of true too that Punch is a, a working class hero who challenges the status quo. Um, to say that like it also include a character like servant, in this case a black uh, guy, and then also blind man. Like Punchy actually don't really discriminate. So Punch kind of beat everyone who gets in the way. There is no um, there's no aristocrat or no like no servant or slaves who can get away from punch slap in um uh, in this show. So so kind of thinking about uh what punch is. So it is the look. Talk about hump hump humpback with the pop belly with the big nose. And then is that squeaky voice or is that slapstick comedy element or that that was done with this special weapon? And then the story that has a, that has a Judy and then other character coming in. Um, but there is something, there is something probably beyond that or there is something that 
is represented by this uh, collection of material things that is a spirit of punch. So, so I this uh, pin has is uh, it is uh, the the creator Ariel Doron. Um, kind of say that like it's the very first uh, traditional hand puppetry from Israel. So I was I want I watched this show along with the Punch and Judy professors in London uh, in 2013. Um, Ariel Doron he learned Punch and Judy by watching YouTube. He actually hasn't by that point. He hadn't really seen Punch and Judy show. He saw it uh, by watching, he, and then he learned it by watching on YouTube, and then he created his own Israeli version of Punch and Judy show. Um, and then, like, um, and by then, like, uh, he didn't know how to use the swazzle. Uh, I mean, the show was uh, show was really well received, and then, like, he, I, I remember he was told that. There's a something more Punch and Judy about his uh, his show than actual Punch and Judy show done in London by Punch and Judy professors. Um, the, he didn't have that story. He didn't use his swazo. So actually, after the show, one of the Punch and Judy professor, uh, Glenn Edwards, actually taught him how to use swazo afterwards. Um, um, then. But there was that spirit. I mean, to me, I believe that what the show was more violent than any Punch and Judy show I actually watched. There was an overweight dog called Yana, was beaten up to death and then put onto grill and then sold for over it. Um, then, then somehow what I thought. What I still think, what I think is that the it's a difficult not to read the Pinhas as a Palestinians in Israel, where in Gaza, where the violence probably is more like more what we they experience probably the violence more frequently and then oppressions and then his house being bulldozed, he get like um, get like bills and stuff. So somehow. Violence in punch probably we can read the violence of punch and Judy show in the time actually when that was born, where the violence, domestic violence, and then perception of woman probably was very different from mine uh, from now. Um, that's that's how I kind of read it, how I read that show where Pinhas was um, we where. I can read the pinhas the way I read the pinhas that helped me to understand the punch and Judy where the moment that it was born. Um, so also one of the most controversial uh, scene in punch and Judy was Jack Cash. The, um, the, so there are people a lot, it, it's been saying that we, that scene should, should be get rid of. But when Punch and Judy was born, that the, the, the public execution was abolished in 1868, where the Punch was Punch Punch and Judy show was in really high top of its popularity in the 19th century. So the public execution was uh, was not just the capital punishment; it was entertainment. It was street entertainment at that time in England. So that. The Punch and Judy, the capital punishment performed in uh, Punch and Judy is not just um, is uh, along probably on the same street where real capital punishment was, uh, where 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 public hanging was performed, and then it really makes sense that Punch tricked the hangman to death. It, it, it can work. You can understand that as a satire. And then they will they will probably work perfectly right. But the thing about Punch and Judy, what I feel is that they Punch and Judy doesn't perform it as a history. It probably people want uh 
criticize this if they continue to say this was what was done in the past. It just have that lively, it kind of life force that punch kind of make everything as current. And then it's not, it's current and then it's being criticized that way. We, I think that's uh, probably that liveness of punch probably make himself into trouble in a way. And then, but the in America, where probably Punch and Judy is probably is not lively, as uh, in in England currently, uh, is where the Punch and Judy is uh, mostly like regularly uh, programmed is in Renaissance fairs, where that people and they dress up and then and like um, is uh, what it was 1960s. Uh, it was born in 1960s in America where people kind of dress and then do like uh, theatrical shows and you have experienced a lot where that Punch and Judy is, is invited to perform in Renaissance fairs. But it's like strictly, and there's another place I discovered was a colonial market in George Washington estate at Mount Vernon that, uh, where there is a record that uh, uh, George Washington actually bought the ticket for Punch and Joan, his wife, uh, in 1742. Uh, so probably that's why Punch and Judy gets featured in that in that annual market, colonial market in the George Washington estate. But it's like strictly speaking, like the period is a little bit off. So, so Punch and Judy in current form, the red and white stripe, the stripes, and then the story of Judy, and then the and that format wasn't born in uh pre nineteenth century. So, but somehow Punch and Judy here was is performed as something of the past in the in the U.S. in currently, but I'm kind of speeding up a little bit. Uh, I don't have much time left. So, so, but having said that, Punch and Judy was in 19th century, one of the most important, pop, uh, was it the, if we, that minstrel dominated the human performance, the Punch and Judy dominated the puppetry in the US. Um, so even it was featured in the cover of the book called American Puppetry. Um, so, so it's uh, these puppets that uh, the collection that resided in the Smithsonian Institution that it was puppet was used by Reverend William E. Hitchcock. So he used, uh, he was a preacher and a showman uh, active between 1890 and 1900. So he used Punch and Judy puppets uh, as, as, as part of his uh, uh, preach, uh, preaching that so he, he performed Punch and Judy in public temperance uh, lectures. So he showed like 12 scenes of uh, history of the United States and followed by Punch and Judy show and then kind of talk about battle within, like battle against evil drink. So Punch and Judy can be used in so many different ways, but as a kind of this morality tales also, that's the, uh, Actually, I don't know how he exactly used it. It's, there's no record of it, but this is how he used it. It's a punch and Judy was used in the US. And what I want you to kind of look at is uh, there's one black character at the bottom, and then the name is Darkie. Uh, it's a really offensive word against uh, African Americans, uh, uh, but it was a pretty common uh, character in Punch and Judy, and of course in miniature shows. Um, but I was always, I found it kind of difficult to comprehend the, this puppet actually featured in the cover of this book. So when I even curated the work, uh, the exhibition of puppetry, uh, racial reckoning, people were very concerned to show the miniature puppets in public. But it's also actually circulated everywhere in in public in the internet, it's not difficult to find like kind of like rendition of menstrual show on the internet. So, so even though people all think that oh I know what menstrual is that is a bad thing, 
But on the other hand, people probably don't know what minstrel looked like or the racism in 19th century looked like and then how it is impacted our popular culture. So, so minstrel died out, probably faded out in the turn of the 20th century, but it still continued to live in popular culture. So the US TV cartoons born around early 20th century, like when many of the characters, including Mickey and Mickey Mouse, were based on minstrel character. He, Mickey Mouse has all the characteristic of uh, uh, minstrelsy with the white, uh, white gloves, with the big exaggerated mouth, and it's a character, a trickster character with the lots of slapstick acts actually came from um, minstrel performance based on minstrel characters. But what was interesting is that uh, Mickey Mouse also quickly forget its origins. So one of the one of the well known uh, uh, cartoon episode made with Mickey Mouse was Melodrama. Um, that was uh, was uh, Mickey Mouse actually performing minstrel version of Uncle Tom's Cabin from many of you know as abolitionist melodrama. Also that also borrow a lot from minstrel show. There's a racist representation of African Americans. Um, so Mickey, who were came from Minstrel Show, putting uh set set dynamite in his mouth and then blacken his face and then starts the show. So it's, uh, that origin is a pretty instant uh sorry I just you quickly even though we probably think that we know what minstrelsy is, but even the character created from minstrelsy kind of quickly forget about where it comes from. And then, then the, the Disney, Disney cartoons, who are, which were really pop, popular in the 20th century, also were adapted into Punch and Judy uh, performance. I mean, it's not like very common, but there we had uh, in the exhibition, we had uh, uh, the Tom Punch and, and probably this Punch professor were a huge fan of Disney. So he had the uh, uh, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse so puppets. And then, um, and then also Three Little Pigs, so, so it's a Disney cartoon. They have it in, in, in the exhibition. And then along with the a clown, Joey the Clown, they saw one of the most beloved character in Punch and Judy's of, it's based on a uh, uh, clown in 19th century in London. I will talk about it later. And then as a, as a also Punch and Judy in the US kind of uh, start to you know, lose its popularity in the 20th century, probably one of the most well-known uh, Punch and Judy performer were Al Flosso. Plus, Al um, he's also, he was also better known as a magician. Known also his uh, his nickname was Coney Island Fakir. Also, you probably know what Fakir means. Is is uh, uh is uh, Muslim uh, is uh, is uh, word for Muslim uh religious Muslim men as like who incarcerated themselves for religious reason. Um, uh, so so that also intelligent there. So this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, Arf Loso, who's uh, is uh, I think it's uh, his punch and Judy set was uh, out for auction. I that got a uh, uh, photograph of. You see the Joy the Clown punch and Judy at the either end of the picture, and then you also see the minstrel picture, minstrel character in there. So he's uh, uh, one of the his uh, famous act of punch and Judy was on film. It's a 19 Marx Brothers monkey monkey business. It was like four stowaways uh, hide into luxury cruise uh, sh cruise ship, and then the whole film was about like uh, the kept the uh, cruise cruise cap uh, officers chasing around these four guys, and then Harpo, one of them, he actually hide behind the punch and booty juice. Um, Booth, and then he got started as soon as he got into the booth and he got beaten up by Punch as well as Judy in this case, uh, with he slapped by them as uh, all the other characters who come into the booth with Punch. 
And then at the end, he got really strangled by, he, he pretend to be puppet, Harpo pretend to be puppet. And then he got like also strangled by captain. But at the end, what happened towards the end was uh, together with the punchy kind of uh, uh, kind of pushed away the captain's officer. So, uh, and then like uh, this uh, 1930s were kind of known as the last hey, last kind of bit of rise of punchy and Judy in the US. And then we have, and then there was one person who learned punch and Judy trade from Arfloso was uh, Charles Ludlam. Charles Ludlam is uh, regarded as one of the most, is very important to uh, avant-garde theater artists in the 1960s and 70s. He, uh, he learned punch and Judy from Arfloso. And then he's a, uh, he's a, uh, he's a, uh, it's a, his performances are kind of best described as a, like ridiculous, as the, his name name of his company. He um, did the, most of his show like deal with the gender bending performances. And then, um, so what he says is that about his show was, uh, is, uh, so his, his work like falls into the classical tradition of a comedy. Um, and then that also, and then he did the Punch and Judy show like every Saturday in his theater and they kind of see it as a kind of children's show. He kind of special show he does for children. And most of his shows were kind of not, it's like this kind of thing that children can be no longer been. This is his uh, uh, show, the Professor Bedlam's Educational Punch and Judy show and then the punch puppet he created for his show in our collection. And then along with the punch character, he has a Jack Cash, the, the hangman, he kept it. But there are some changes in other, and the addition in his, his creation. One is the African man. So in, in the 70s, in coming into 60s and 70s, he, the, 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 it's the, the kind of understanding of black people even changes that is no longer uh, that is uh, he kind of get the character outside of menstrual tradition and then in his show we had he had African men and the bird is it's also that reflect his kind of flamboyancy is uh, so it, what is called Margaret Dumont time he appears in 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 like Max Brothers series as um uh, one uh, is the actress who were, appears in Max Brothers uh, comedy series. And then like in the, I'm kind of nearly the end. So, so health and so, so punch and the, what you include in punch and Judy as characters can change changes depending on what the punch and Judy professor want to do. So it's, for example, Glenn Edwards, who actually we ad adapt the, the minister uh, puppets into the contemporary character, like his health and safety officer, when you see on the left. And then also he, in his show, there's a Boris Jones, what's going on you, you, you in the UK politics, like today, just today, I don't know what, who, is, who will appear in his show next time. But when Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson also appeared in his show, also all of them get very good slap from punch. So Joseph Grimaldi, I kind of repeatedly introduced in uh, in the talk is the Joey the Clown. He he's uh, he's the creator of the image what we know as clown now, who was very popular in the uh, in in the ton, in the nineteenth century in London, and then he created that the look of a clown, and then. Because of the popularity, his the character came into Punch and Judy, and then of course he also gets slapped by the punch. Um, now we don't remember this person, this this uh, uh, actor performer in the nineteenth century, but it is remembered in in Punch tradition, um, and then as a joy and they will be continuously uh, performed as joy as the Punch and Judy tradition will continue. So Punch and Judy had uh, this year it was 360th birthday of Punch and Judy. And then, so it was uh, the biggest birthday party for Punch was uh, uh, 
350s in 2012. So I will always be questioned that why it was that moment when Samuel Pepe saw that Puccinella show. Punch didn't have the look, it didn't have the story. It was very far from who he is now. Like it's a different guy. Why did this kind of declare that as his birth? The one thing it did was it, it created that history, that 300 year old history. But what I feel that what it did was also that it gave potential for Punch to continue to evolve. So con it will continue to, it, so Punch and Judy will evolve, I believe that for the next 300 years or 360 years from now, uh, as the, it remembers, and then it will remember us as it remembers Jack Catch and then Joseph Grimaldi in his show. And then we will all get very good slack from him. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Min? Thank you so much. That was so interesting and informative. I really have to say, I didn't know much about Punch and Judy. I learned a lot. Anybody? You can hello. feel free. <laughs> hello. Hello. Um, I am a Punch and Judy performer in oh. England. Oh, who and is this? There we oh, go. Oh, yes. Yes. I get it. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> There he is. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for bringing your punch. <laughs> um, he was out yesterday. He was out performing yesterday. Um, there's a few things I'd, I'd like to add to your talk. Can I just say as well, I love your red and white stripy top. Yes. <laughs> that, that just goes so well with the Punch and Judy booth. Yeah. Um, about the violence, I've often been harangued by various people going, How can you do that? That's not allowed. You know, it should be banned. Well, people have been trying to ban it for 360 years, yeah? And um, my reply to them is, if you're going to ban Punch and Judy, you should really ban Shakespeare. Because with all the knife crime and so on in, in the country, um, you go and see Julius Caesar, and that's real people actually being stabbed. So if you're going to represent violence that way, Punch and Judy should be fine. There should be no no um, discrimination against puppets doing violence when you can go and see it on stage um, in, in Shakespeare, yeah? Um, another important part of the Punch and Judy show is the audience. I always say that 50% of the show is the reaction of the audience, yeah? Because the audience can take you in so many different directions and then you come back to the story and carry on. Yeah, things can happen during the show. Someone can stand up and um, someone can shout something out. Someone can walk past and you can fly with it. You can improvise um, and go along. You were talking about topicality. Um, during the Second World War, there was regularly um, a puppet of Hitler in Punch and Judy shows. And of course, Punch would beat him up, much to the delight of the crowd, the same as he would Jack Ketch, you know, in years gone by. And even in the 70s and 80s, when Dallas was wildly popular here in England, um, there would be a puppet of J.R. J.R. Ewing from, because he was the baddie in Dallas, yeah? So it does keep pop, it does keep being popular and so on. Um, in my show, we have no hanging scene. Uh, because children don't know about hanging. Um, and at the end of my show, it's very moralistic in that Mr. Punch ends up with no friends. And he asks the children why. And they say, it's because you've been hitting people. So there's a huge moral message there. And then he asks them to be his friends. Yeah. And, and so, so it continues. Can I just add um, about the sausages as well? We didn't get a mention of sausages. <laughs> sausages are so important in Punch and Judy. And that slide you showed there of the 350th birthday party, 
and um, Mr. Punch had a giant birthday cake. What was inside his birthday cake? 350 sausages. Yeah, because he loves sausages. Can I just mention as well that um, Punch and Judy is not just alive in England, it's alive all around the UK. Yeah, it's not confined um, to England, but I've been performing for about 25 years. And yes, my show has changed over the years, but um, you know, he's earned his keep, yeah? And he, he earns me my keep. But thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I also didn't have alligator in my show, in my talk. Crocodile. There are a lot Crocodile. Of things, I know. And then also, that's the way to do it. <laughs> that's the way to do it. <laughs> the catch, yeah. yeah, catchphrase of Punch every time he, he kind of succeeded doing the, his act that he get approval from his audience saying, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, for your perspective. That's very interesting. <laughs> We do have a question from Pamela. <laughs> yes, Does Judy oh, ever come that, out yeah. on top? Yes, yeah, so yeah, Alisa also answered it. The, the, I was going to mention Sarah Nolan's Judy Saves the Day. Also, she's a UConn graduate. Uh, she also picked up Punch and Judy. And then it was a, I, mean, I haven't had to, I have to see the show, but the also Alisa also, I believe she's doing um uh She's doing research on feminist punch, and then so we people. Um, there was also I also saw um a presentation. I kind of vaguely remember, probably in in, in women and puppetry, perhaps that is also punch and Judy was also also utilized in during suffragette movement, like women's rights movement. Or so, so it's a, yeah, it's a, there, yeah, there has been, yeah, there were, yeah, and then we'll continue, and then even that, that field will kind of, I believe, will grow. Would you like me to elaborate on that, Min? Yes, yes, thank so, you, Alisa. So there's research by a um, expert in the British suffragette movement in the UK named Naomi Paxton, who contributed a piece about the way Judy was wielded in the service of the British suffragette movement at the turn of the century. And she was used as a character uh, and there were performances that were created featuring Judy um, and she had her say. We're actually uh, looking at possibly restaging some of those as part of a project that I'm doing here in the UK. Thank you. There, um, there have also been more contemporary instances where Judy has a, a different role, different uh, punch professors, as um, Professor Can pointed out, have taken their own, uh, they had their own perspective on the show. And there have been pieces or performances such as Punked and Judy, where Judy was quite contemporary. That was from, I believe, the 80s, uh, maybe the 90s. And there are several other instances. Yeah. Thank you, Alyssa. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, I had a question. Do you yes, see, was, um, uh, if I could ask a quick question and then yeah. we can see if there's any others, please feel yeah. free to put them in the chat if you have any questions. Um, do you see any um, very contemporary political themes in Punch and Judy shows today? Um, I haven't been, I haven't been to Mayf I haven't seen like Punch and Judy show for a while since I moved to US. Um, but Glenn Ed was I, I, uh, I, the the who has Boris Johnson. I be, I saw, I believe I have one. I, I saw on YouTube, he also had a banker when there were a lot of things, the finance, during the financial club crisis. And then um, the, the, Health and safety officer is in a way very uh, the I I showed briefly is very in a way very political when the, there were a lot of more regulation put on by authorities on punch and duty show they need to follow the more strict rules of the health and safety issue about like you or the fire code and stuff then it was uh, his critique on that so yes also is really depending on 
as Jonathan just mentioned that if you in school, you can kind of teach children some moral and then kind of some ethics through Ponchi and Judy, but on the street, you can be a commentator or uh, commentator for politics, current current affairs. Same and then like Pinas, the Israeli uh, Ponchi and Judy is extremely political. That one was the whole piece was a political satire. That there were, yeah, there was one question by was I don't I don't the Peter was it Peter yeah oh uh, oh there yes. are two Peter here oh yeah Peter Allen and Peter <laughs> yes okay I'm also can you hear yes yes I'm also a punch performer from England I've been doing it somewhat less years than Jonathan mm -hmm. um and certainly Glyn Edwards is Judy and Professor Peanuts, his daughter, his Judy has spiky hair and a nose jewel. She certainly doesn't have the traditional mob cap. And uh, I was speaking to Glyn and, and he said when he changed his Judy like that, he, he didn't feel that he could hit her or he, that Punch could hit her. And and I think, and, and, and I think it's a bit uh, of horses for courses in a way, um, because traditionally, Judy is the one that hits Punch quite severely at the beginning. Um, in my show, Punch doesn't hit Judy. He sort of just pushes her down with the slapstick, but she does have a mob cap, which is... Um, a bit like a crash helmet, really. Um, but my audience are perfectly content that the policeman should be hit. And they're perfectly content that the devil should be hit. And they rather like it at the end when the devil is turned into sausages and the crocodile appears from under the playboard and whips them away. Whereupon Judy makes an a real makes a reappearance, and Mr. Punch has his third big kiss, and gets three cheers. Um, the only moral bit in my show is that the devil says, "Oh, I'll hide in here," and he's in the sausage machine, and he says, "Oh, I should pretend to be Judy," and Punch comes up, and he's hidden in the sausage machine, and. And then he pops up and Punch says, you're not Judy. He says, no, I'm not Judy. No more kisses and no more sausages for you. I was going to add, be sure your sins will find you out, but that would really have been taking it out of context. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for joining me from England. Like, Also, I love that other other Peter Allen, Peter, I, you're the also the also Punch and Judy professor in the U.S. Is it right that uh, actually I haven't met Peter Punch and Judy professor is uh, I came here, so yeah, I am I on? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, well, we do a Punch and Judy show. And uh, you were mentioning about topical people that come on, and we built a puppet of uh, 45. I don't like using his real name, but he entered into the Punch and Judy show, and his question to the audience, of course, was, does anybody know where the girls' dressing room is? He had a very bad reputation for that, and uh, yeah. we had a ton of uh, lots of verbal uh, audience feedback when that character came in. He had very loose hair and a giant red, white, and blue striped tie. So everybody knew exactly who he was. And uh, uh, it was very good. I think the other thing we need to remember is that these aren't people. So that they don't die. They're puppets. And if they're good, they're made out of wood. So they make a lot of noise when they're dying, especially when their heads sit on the playboard. So. I don't have anything else to say, but yeah, uh, we also want a uh, Unima citation for that uh, Punch and Judy show uh, that we do all the time. So um, 
yeah, we're pretty <laughs> proud of our Punch and Judy show here in the U.S. So yeah, I, I want to learn more off. about it. Actually, what's going on in the U.S. Uh, haven't had oh well yeah. i know about me i know there are performers in seattle clay martin and uh, i can't remember what the ladies name ellie levington levinson levinson i think uh and um yeah there's performers all over the u.s you're welcome to come and visit anytime just get on a bus and drive here it's pretty easy <laughs> to get to thank you yeah. oh you're welcome bye-bye Thank you, Peter. Please, if you'd like to share your email, you can certainly do that privately through the chat. Um, I wanted to mention to everyone that we do have the Albert Walker exhibition as a virtual tour. Um, I did try to get the link for, for us for today to put that in chat um, and the web page is down at the moment, but I will make sure to email um, everyone the link to that um, virtual tour if you weren't able to get to um, to see us uh, to see the exhibit. It was pretty, pretty great exhibit. Um, anybody have any other questions? This has really been a great conversation today. Anybody? Well, I'd like to just take a minute to thank Min. This was really great. And thank you all for coming today. Um, I did want to just share a couple of upcoming events that we have at the CHS, just to take a minute to do that. Uh, of course, it's October, and uh, we have a lot to say about witches in Connecticut and colonial times. Um, we predate uh, the Salem story. So we are having that uh, an afternoon virtual talk on Friday the 28th, um, and that is free. And then of course, Saturday the 29th, um, we've been doing a day, Dia de Muertos community celebration with Ofrendas um, for several years now. And it's, it's a really fun day with some crafts um, and some food and a lot going on with that. So that is the 29th uh, during the day. Uh, on site at the CHS in Hartford. And then on Tuesday, November 1st is our next uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, and we have Judge Cohen who will speak about uh, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus. So that should be uh, just in time uh, before the election that are coming in November. So we, that'll be a great conversation as well. And of course, all of this you can uh, a get to from our website, of course. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. And um, this has been really great. And thank you. And I hope we see you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye now, everyone. Thank <laughs> bye, you. bye, Punch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye bye now.